Good morning. Good morning, RMP family and friends. I was going to shout something out of the current events associated with Vietnam. Good morning, RMP. Uh, but yeah, but good morning. Welcome. Um, some of you may recall last year, in keeping up with current events pre-election, I uh, I dosed in the use of superlative adjectives, one in particular, quite a bit regarding this this program, the RMP as a whole, the annual meeting, and uh, much to my chagrin, we've seen an overdose continuous abuse and misuse of superlative adjectives. So I'm going to refrain from use of superlative adjectives to call attention to this good program that we have. <laughs> and uh, let me see. And today we have we have a good RMP and we have a, a good program, good plus maybe. <laughs> and so what a big part of it we are going to celebrate that we've been in. in a family for 25 plus years, if you consider the the efforts, the pilot efforts leading up to it. But we've been formally a regional monitoring program for 25 years, and arguably one of the good ones. And uh, and we're going to reflect on that. But what I can say with certainty is that we have always and we do the best we can. We've always tried. We're, we we're doing the best we can, and we're doing always. We're always looking ahead or addressing the most eminent issues affecting the Bay and, and our theme today, we have three areas where we are putting new attention or uh, continued attention, the margins, nutrients, and contaminants emerging concern. So um, I'll let you be the judge of how good or good plus the program is today. But in the spirit of, of considering if, if, if anybody deserves uh, some sort of superlative accolades, there are three people who've been part of the RMP family that have are recently or, or on the verge of retiring soon, and we want to quickly recognize them. One of them is Diane White, who is decided to retire from the Regional Water Board after 25 plus years of service, but includes five years where she was the Regional Board's rep on the on the RNP steering committee. She also, if you didn't know, she was also instrumental for the formation of the of the Aquatic Science Center, which allowed the San Francisco Estuary Institute to be sort of a recognized state entity by joining into a point, a joint powers agreement with the water boards and the Bay Area Clean Water Agency, which has been allowed us to bring more partner money, more uh, money to build upon our, our base funds from the RNP. So uh, thank you, Diane. I can tell you that my partnership with her at the board has just been good. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. Very, good. very good. Another, another person that merits uh, 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 superlative accolades is is Dave Schollhammer. Uh, many of you know that he's uh, he's in the mud. I've had the privilege of getting a little bit of uh, being able to allow me to put my toe into the into the water as, as part of his, the, the mud club that he's an instrumental part of. Thank you, Dave. You've had a, you've made my Made my work here a lot of fun because I've uh, you inspire me. You've uh, you you've taught me a lot of things. And uh, and if those of you who want to get a taste of what he's done for us and for the Bay, if you're going to the State of the Estuary Conference next week, uh, he's giving a presentation on on everything he knows and everything you should want to know about sediment in the Bay. And then Jim Clern, he's, it's easy to say that we know that Jim has done a lot for us all and for the Bay dedication. And uh, unfortunately, he, he's still with us, but he's told us he is retiring finally. He's been threatening for a while, but we want to recognize him today while he's here. And as you know, he's on the program. And so he, as usual, will inspire us. And I certainly appreciate that much he's inspired and taught me. And uh, even most recently, I keep learning things. So on that note, you might think, oh, I've been doing this for a long time. And I, I can just, I, can, I just turn. 64 years young last Sunday. So um, you might wonder what my future is. So I'm going to announce today that I'm retiring in about 10 years. <laughs> Dave, I love, I still, I love my job. I still having fun. And as long, as long as the music's good, I'm going to keep on dancing. And I can tell you the RMP is one of the funnest, if not the the, the funnest parts of my work, and I, and I like their playlist, love their playlist. So in, so in that note, let's get this party started.
All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I also wanted to say we have a pretty good <laughs> pulse. <this year. laughs> so people, the RMP is um, a, a, here today and is, is a pretty good program after all these years due to the participation of people, people who show up for meetings like this one. So I want to thank everybody for showing up and helping us celebrate the 25th anniversary of the RMP. Um, I want to especially thank some of the alumni um, who are here today. Um, I run the risk of missing some, some folks who I may have not noticed yet, but people like Chuck Weir, Ray Arnold, Reiner Honecke, um, I see Russ Flegel over there. Um, I think I saw Dave Tucker walk in a minute ago. So um, it's really great to have the alumni to make this an extra special day. Um, this first session is going to get us off to an excellent start. We've got three distinguished speakers that are going to reflect on the, the theme of the 25th anniversary of the program. Um, first off will be Steve Weisberg. He's the executive director of our sister, SFEI sister agency, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Um, Steve is a Wolverine, got his undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan. Any Michigan connection here? All right. If, if you hear your university, I expect a, you know, some kind of noise as we go along. Go Bears! <laughs> not yet, Tom. It's got to be part, part of the biography, sir. <laughs> um, and Steve got his PhD from the University of Delaware. <laughs> 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 So we asked Steve to be our leadoff speaker because um, I think he's very well suited to provide an external perspective on the, um, how the RMP fits into the broader picture of water quality monitoring at the state and national level. Um, he brings a wealth of experience in developing monitoring programs around the country, including Chesapeake Bay, New York, New Jersey, New Jersey Harbor, Tampa Bay, as well as EPA's Environmental Monitoring and Assessment Program. Upon moving to California 21 years ago, he was instrumental in developing the Southern California BITE Regional Monitoring Program. He's also active on a number of California advisory committees, including the Ocean Protection Council, the Sea Grant Program, and the California Water Quality Monitoring Council. He's also very familiar with the RMP. Um, he was a valuable member of the program review panel for the 2003 um, program review. And he's been a, a member of the Exposure and Effects work group since that, that work group formed in 2001. Please welcome Steve Weisberg. Thanks, Jay. Uh, what an honor it is to, uh, to be your kickoff speaker for the celebration of your 25th anniversary. It's a, a pretty big accomplishment for you, and I'm just pleased to be here to, to share some perspectives. Uh, usually when I start, start to talk about regional monitoring, <clears throat> I start with the, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where is this? There we go. Should, should do with the thing. There we go. All right. <laughs> There you go. So usually I start with um, kind of the reasons why you want to do regional monitoring. Um, you know, the, the fact that you want to understand trends, the fact that you want to be able to prioritize among things. But I don't think I need to talk to this audience about that. In fact, what I've been asked to talk about is because I do have an set of experiences uh, helping to be one of the people who started the Chesapeake Bay Monitoring Program and some of the National Estuary Programs on the East Coast kind of give perspective on how's the RMP doing after 25 years. So it's not really about whether the monitoring is worth doing, but is it being done well? So I'll cut to the chase, and I'll be more complimentary than Tom is. Um, this is a very well done program. Um, and I put up here on the board uh, what I think of as the five key things that you're looking for in a regional monitoring program. Uh, the first, and the first with a bullet, is do you have clear objectives? And are those objectives tied to the management community uh, that is going to use it? Because producing data for data's sake isn't really all that useful. Um, I think this program is 
really a wonderful example of how it does. I'll elaborate on that in, in, in a second. Is it adapted to changing needs? Because I promise you the three things that Tom talked about, uh, CECs, nutrients, plastics, weren't what you were worried about 25 years ago, and so clearly you have adapted. Uh, the third is, is the science being conducted collaboratively? Again, I'm going to elaborate on all of these. Um, have you effectively communicated? And Tom held up a very nice report. I had a chance. I got a preview copy. I had a chance to read it. Just very well done. Um, and then the last is, do you have a long-term commitment? Because regional monitoring is usually not just about a snapshot, but it's about being able to look at those trends. And it's, um, that's an area where you all excel. In fact, I'll even start there by saying uh, one of the things I asked Jay to do is put together for me a list of the people who have been with the program for more than 20 years. And um, even though some people here are either just retired or about to retire, um, that's an impressive list of people who have been with the program for a long time. So um, it says something that they want to stay involved, as Tom just said, but it also says something about providing continuity because you don't want a long-term program to be changing every five minutes as new people come aboard. So you get new ideas, but you have continuity. Um, second thing I identified is scientific collaboration. Why is that so important? Well, it starts with number one. Um, I look at SFEI, they're about the same size as my organization, something on the order of 50 people. If you try and do it yourself, you're not going to get all that far because you not have enough expertise to cover all of the areas. Um, second, it's great for cost sharing perspective. So from the perspective of you all, um, each of you is contributing a lot less than you would need to contribute if you were to do it alone. But the third one I think is the most important is um, as Jay said, I run a sister organization in Southern California, and I find it interesting. When I get a brand new scientist coming to work for me, usually somebody who just finished a PhD or a postdoc, to them, the end point is, ooh, I published a paper, and ooh, I published it in a really high-level journal. Well, I got news for them. That is great. It's a nice thing on your resume, but the science doesn't get used because you published it in the journal. All right? First off, you have to have better communication than that. But more importantly, managers don't want to act on the basis of what one scientist published in one journal article. What they want to do is act when the, con the community, the scientific community, has come to consensus. And in essence, my commissioners, my board looks at me, and you know, what they say is, I don't want to go home, make a decision based upon what you told me, and then find out tomorrow that somebody else has a different opinion. And this is an area where I think that the RMP excels more than most. So um, again, I worked with Jay to, to put together some statistics on collaboration. And this is an impressive set of numbers. Uh, I mean, first off, 67 organizations participated from a funding perspective. So again, you have buy-in at low, I mean, literally buy-in from the management community. Um, but over 50 organizations involved in the programmatic committee. So where are you getting your advice and your direction for the program? 41 organizations that have been funded to help do the work where you bring in the other science organizations. Um, and I would suggest to you that these are not just numbers that come um, as happens. This is a mindset that the program has actively adapted, adopted. Um, because the RMP has recognized their role is not to be the smartest people in the room. They may be, but that's not their role. Their role is to focus other scientists on the issues to the management community and using the, the vehicle of the RMP um, interactions to help focus other scientists who might be at academic institutions, state agencies, to all work in, together towards kind of a common set of problems. And I think um, uh, one of the things that you'll see as a great example, I, I, it's wonderful to have Jim Claren as the next speaker because that's a perfect example of where um, they were able to leverage some things that were already going on uh, before they got started, but really focus them around issues that were concerned to their management, the RMP management community, while at the same time providing additional funding and additional, um, I guess, reason to be uh, for the USGS program, enhancing their ability to continue their program into the future. So just a wonderful example of where the RMP has been successful far beyond uh, where uh, the funding for this program alone. Um, but I would suggest to you that the collaboration goes far beyond just collaboration among scientists. It's the management collaboration that is really unusual in the RMP and unusual in a very good way uh, because um, 
what you want to be able to do is reach conclusions about what the science says. And the RMP structure, while you may sit there at times and curse about all the number of meetings you need to go to to participate in the RMP, and serving on one committee that might get overruled by a committee above it or get overruled by a committee above it, um, the fact that you're having all those right conversations um, about what the program should be focused on and then how to interpret those results um, is really what I think makes the program special. There are way too many monitoring programs where it's just sent off to an academic institution to collect data, and then you figure out afterwards what are we going to do with the data. Because you all have been involved in the design of the program, not the technical design, but the design of what are the questions you're trying to answer and why, and how you're going to use the information, um, I think you all have just created something that's special. Okay, I mentioned that the adaptation is important. Um, and it's important for many reasons. Obviously, the program uh, tends to, the, the issues tend to change. Um, uh, you all have been wonderful in how you do this. Besides the fact that you have a lot of programmatic and standing committees to do it, you've also gone through the process of introspective. I mean, you've been around for 25 years, and you've already had two programmatic reviews. Um, and, the, and more importantly, just holding the programmatic reviews a lot of programs around the country, they'll have a bunch of experts come in and they'll say, what, what are your suggestions? And then those suggestions will sit on the table. I've seen where this program has been really responsive to those suggestions. So your 99, 1997 review um, basically had, as I saw it, uh, looking from the outside, two major um, suggestions. One, you used to have what I used to, what I call a down the spine of the bay program. Um, which is very typical of what was being done in most programs in the 90s. And as I mentioned, I came from the Chesapeake Bay program. That's what we did. And it was right about that time where people seemed to be called stratified random designs or probability based design. Because we realized that the, what's happening in the spine of the bay is not the same thing that's happening on the edges of the bay. Um, and you all responded to that review um, by modifying your program design. And I'm actually very glad to see you have a session this afternoon that's focused on, on that. You have an article in one of in, in the RMP talking about uh, that. Um, the other thing that you went to is, it's not just about what's there, but it's also about the pathways that come in, what leads into the system. And you modified your program to do that. Uh, again, um, uh, my, uh, my admiration for what you did there. Um, 2004, I was a part of that review. And the biggest recommendation that we had is, you're focused on chemistry. But in the end, what managers really want to know is, did the chemistry have an effect? <clears throat> is the biology affected by it? And so we suggested you initiate a biology portion of your program. And you did. And you're now doing, as it says, the bird egg contamination, more fish, more invertebrates. Um, so I think this is a great example of where the program has adapted beyond the other things like CECs and plastics that you've moved on to. You've taken the core of the program and adapted. Um, all right, so now I've been talking about all the things that you're doing right. Um, but in the end, those are details. Um, one of the things that I look at with my program, my program's coming up on its 50th anniversary, um, and we started adding up how much money the organization has spent. I did the same thing for you all, all right? Um, you were getting pretty darn close to about $100 million. Uh, and so one of the things I think you should be looking at yourself as you continue on this program go, have I got $100 million worth of benefit? Not $100 million worth of samples, but has society, which paid this $100 million, um, benefited? Um, and there are many ways that people can benefit. Again, not just have been more journal papers been published, but are people um, enjoying a better bay? Is the bay cleaner? Um, are less people getting sick when they swim or less sick when they... Uh, when they eat the fish. And I would suggest to you that looking at your program from the outside, the answer is the definitive yes. Um, first off, you know, you can talk about TMDLs. I have seen how TMDLs are done badly in other places. Um, I've also seen examples of where they're based upon data and scientific study. And I think you've got some great examples. Um, obviously, you know, you've got mercury, PCBs, and selenium. I think, Jay, you even have a few talks uh, that are coming up today that are going to highlight some of those uh, examples. Um, uh, fish consumption advisories. 
Um, you know, I look back, uh, I actually had the, the pleasure of reading the, the history of the article and just looking at how this program has informed what are the fish advisories that are done. So in essence, you're putting fish advisories on the right places on the right fish. So in fact, people are going to be safer. More importantly, they're not going to be advisories in places where people want to fish, um, but, might, but might otherwise be told not to because you have a lack of, of data. Um, uh, obviously, PBDEs, you all were the group that really, because of the data you collected, forced this issue statewide. So in fact, we've been beneficiaries in Southern California from the data that you all collected that led to uh, uh, the, the banning of PVDs. And of course, and now you're working on a CEC strategy. But it's not just the accomplishments that you, you've developed, it's also the red herrings you've avoided because those become incredibly costly. You spend a lot of money to fight, chase a problem that doesn't need chasing um, or uh, implement a solution that would be an inappropriate solution because you didn't have enough information. And uh, one of the best examples is copper. I mean, this is one where you clearly exceed the ocean plant criteria for copper but the effects are not there because of the particular circumstances. If you didn't have the data set that you had in the RMP, you'd probably spend $100 million to go fix a problem that really isn't the problem. Um, now you've been able to focus your area in the right thing. So I think you're doing great there. Um, the RMP also provides you a great safety net because as you start to make these decisions about this thing is a red herring, don't put your effort into that. Not that big a deal because if you're wrong, you've got the monitoring program that lets you assess, wait a minute, do we, do we not pay attention? Maybe copper is going up. So you've got the safety valve. Without the safety valve, you couldn't take an issue like that and, and deal with it in the way that you did. Okay, you have future challenges, and I have five minutes left to tell you what they are. Um, I would suggest to you um, that these are um, your future challenges. Um, you're going to have new scientific issues. Um, you're going to have a next generation problem because all those people are retiring. Um, and interestingly, finance is not high on the list. Um, any other program in the nation, I'd probably say finance is high on the list. Uh, one of the things I found very interesting in observing your program, when, um, and this goes to your successes, when this program first got started, it was started largely by the regional board. And my observation from the outside is people felt like it was a tax. Um, after a while, it became a program that SFEI started to implement, and people were okay to interact with them. I've observed how in the last 10 or 15 years, it's a program that's owned by the people who contribute the funds to it. Um, and, and I guess they've just seen the value in it. Um, so uh, just congratulations to you that that, that is not issue. You always fight about how much money, because uh, everybody's going to want more for this and that. Uh, so um, science needs, that's going to evolve. Um, I promise you, um, I can put a list up here of things. Um, it will evolve. That's not going to be your issue because I think you have the right scientists playing with you, um, you have the right management conversations. Um, as you evolve that science, I think that the issue will be um, continue to have those conversations. Um, one of the things I find with my organization is you've got a challenge between, um, uh, as, you ha as you interact between scientists and managers, managers tend to say, I got a problem that needs to be solved tomorrow, and put all your effort into that. Scientists say, here's a problem that you've got that you won't see for 10 years, and a lot of the climate change things come in there. My organization refers to that as the healthy tension and finding the balance between filling short-term leads and also having the vision. I think that's the thing that you all, particularly culturally, will have to continue to play with. Um, tell you what, I will finish with this slide. Um, I think the biggest challenge you have um, is exactly the slide that I opened with that showed all the people in the program for 20 plus years and the kind of thing that Tom showed, the number of people who will be retiring soon. And it'd be great if you get another 10 years out of Tom, um, but um, all, even, so all those other people are gonna change. I think what you need to do is make sure that the vision that you all have created is effectively being passed to those people. Um, and I think that uh, this particular moment, this 25th anniversary is exactly the right time to be celebrating what you do, communicating what we do, um, and setting yourself up um, for the opportunity to basically spread that message across the different generations. And with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. So we have a couple minutes for short questions for Steve. So. 
Ben? Could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that Scorpio is facing? Like as you turn on your 50th? So um, I think the challenges we're facing, uh, again, I'll put into multiple categories. Um, category number, what are the technical challenges? What are the, the project areas we're working on? And I think those uh, mirror a lot of what you have. I'd probably say there are three above others. Um, number one is nutrients, um, because the cost of nutrient changes are so substantial. Um, and in particular, in the Bay Area, you know, you've got a very interesting challenge because you have a lot of nutrients that have been basically uh, effect limited by some of the physical conditions in the Bay. Um, as those physical conditions change, as those supply issues kind of change, um, that, that's going to be a big one. We, we have very similar kinds of issues. Um, uh, they're a little bit different, but that's one of our biggest technical challenges. The second biggest technical challenge is um, emergency patterns. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to go there. Um, uh, climate change. Um, uh, and that's one of the harder ones because most of the issues associated with climate change are not short term. And they really require a long term study and long term commitment. And, and for the managers, it's tougher because the decisions they need to make um, are less clear. And so that becomes, <laughs> I guess that's my cue to finish up. Huh? <laughs> um, but I would also argue that, that the challenge I mentioned about that tension between short-term and long-term issues is probably the biggest challenge, is making sure, uh, we, we've actually set a goal that 75% of what we have our people work on are the things that are really dictated by the community as short-term needs, and 25% are things that are longer-term that don't have short-term decisions like climate change. Okay, thank you, Steve. So, but, uh, really enjoyed Steve's talk. I think he did a really nice job of setting the stage for something I'd like to cover in the discussions um, section of this first session, and that is looking forward and some of the challenges that the RMPL face. Our next speaker is Jim Clarn, a senior research scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey, but that title doesn't really capture. Uh, um, the stature of, of Jim. Um, Jim is a Badger, did his undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin. All right, Meg. <laughs> he got his master's from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Okay, crickets, crickets. And a PhD from Washington State University. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, as I was pulling together the um, Pulse article on the history of the RMP, um, I got some good stories out of people, and one of the nuggets I got was from Bruce Thompson, who was the first RMP manager. He told me how Jim's work um, as a pilot study got started in the RMP, and this is a quote from Bruce. Richie told us that this was just going to be so, no RFP, no selection process. But Steve Richie had great judgment. In including Jim's work in the program, and this has been one of the cornerstones of the RMP. Um, Jim has had a highly productive and distinguished career. Um, I just want to mention a couple of highlights. Um, just this year, Jim is receiving the Odom Award um, for Lifetime Achievement from the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation. It's named for three outstanding ecological scientists in the Odom family, Howard, Eugene, and William. How many of you have heard of the Odom family? All right, they, they wrote, they wrote the, the early um, key textbooks on ecology that the older folks among us uh, came up with. Um, the award honors an individual whose record of sustained accomplishments has made important contributions to our understanding of estuaries and coastal ecosystems. And then um, another a nugget I pulled out of Jim's long list of awards and accomplishments is from 2012, the Brown Nichols Science Award. And this is an award given biennially to recognize the contributions of a scientist for significant research and active involvement in facilitating the use of science to manage the San Francisco estuary and watershed. Um, it's special to us at SFEI because Randy Brown and Fred Nichols were on the SFEI Board of Directors for many years. Um, so we've been very fortunate to have Jim be part of the RMP 
and Bay Delta Science community over the years. Please welcome Jim Clorn. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, can I move around? Can you hear me okay? It's hard for me to stand still. I, I was uh, asked this question by a director of the U.S. Geological Survey after I'd given a talk at a meeting. And when I, when I heard this, my immediate reaction was, what a dumbass question this is. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that, but I mean, I was, what? A, and after a while, I calmed down and, um, and I reflected on this, and I realized this is actually a good question. And um, I think that I was motivated by this question to kind of go on the circuit and teach people the critical importance of long-term observational programs like the regional monitoring programs. So that's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to talk about the unique value of long-term observational research. And I'm going to do this by telling stories. And the stories are going to follow this uh, timeline um, at the bottom of this slide here that, as you can see, can't see. Oh, there we go. Uh, begins in the 1960s. And I think it's important to uh, begin with a very brief historical account of the science that was done in San Francisco Bay that set the stage for the creation of the Regional Monitoring Program. So the stories that I'm going to tell uh, begin in 1967 when Dave Peterson uh, was hired by the USGS in Menlo Park. The year after that, the USGS hired John Conamos. And either one or two years after that, Fred Nichols, I'm not sure. These three guys were graduate students together in the School of Oceanography at the University of Washington. They actually shared a house together. And when they came to the USGS in Miller Park, along with a couple of uh, coastal marine geologists, they looked around and thought about San Francisco Bay, and they learned that hardly anybody is doing anything in San Francisco Bay, and we know hardly anything about San Francisco Bay. In that era, we didn't even use the word estuary when we talked about San Francisco Bay. So they had this vision for launching a, a research program to sample the hell out of San Francisco Bay. They, uh, they found this uh, wooden ship. They converted it in, into a research vessel. They laid out this uh, network of, of uh, sampling stations along the spine of San Francisco Bay that sampled the whole estuary from the lower South Bay up to the, up to the Sacramento River. And, uh, and on the 10th of April in 1969, used this ship to make the very first sampling measurement uh, in San Francisco Bay. And so from my perspective, this was the beginning of an era of fast-paced discovery of what San Francisco Bay is. And so in that era, John Conamos was interested, for example, in patterns of circulation and mixing in the bay. He made the first measurements to demonstrate that the bay has this characteristic circulation pattern, this two-layer circulation of estuaries uh, that lead to the formation of turbidity maximum in the upper part of the estuary. And Fred was interested in the communities of invertebrates that live in the sediments. And it occurred to him, he discovered very early in his work, uh, how important uh, introduced species were in, the, in that community. He launched that whole uh, direction of, of research. And Dave, uh, the marine chemist, uh, was interested in pH and the organic carbon system and dissolved oxygen, but also nutrients. He did the early work on nutrients in the bay. And he was interested in the spatial pattern of nutrient concentrations along the estuarine salinity gradient. He was interested in how they change seasonally and from year to year. Even in that era, Dave was interested in climate variability and its effect on the bay. So during this era of discovery, this was an era of growth building to a big science program supported by the USGS. And so additional hires were, this was a crazy era there. We were actually hiring scientists in this era. And, um, so in 1975, Sam Lawoma was hired, and he began investigations of heavy metals in, in the estuary, especially related to bioaccumulation. He used clams as biological indicators of accumulation of metals in organisms. And then a year later, I was hired. I was hired to launch a program of research on plankton ecology and start thinking about ecosystem modeling. And uh, early in my work here, I became really intrigued by this paradox we knew the bay had high nutrient concentrations, but phytoplankton 
biomass abundance and production weren't, weren't as high as we expected that they should be based on those nutrient concentrations. So over a period of years, we discovered that there are a number of mechanisms that gives the bay resistance to, to this nutrient enrichment problem, including fast grazing by abundant clams in, in the South Bay that filter feed the, 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 the whole volume of water in the South Bay a day or two during the summertime. Um, so this era of discovery continued for uh, into the into the 1980s, and I think it probably peaked in in the early 1980s. And um, I think the end of this era came a, around 1986. And I'm picking 1986 because that was the year that we we published this uh, cover story in Science Magazine. And this was a synthesis of everything that we had learned over a period of a decade and a half or so studying San Francisco Bay and how and why it had changed over that period of time. So we talked about things like contaminants in the estuary and, and how they vary from year to year depending on river flow. Uh, Brian Atwater was working at the USGS in the Delta at the time. He published this study where he told us, where he taught us for the first time, that 98% of the tidal wetlands had been lost from the Bay Delta system. We were interested in nutrients. This is a time series of nitrate concentrations in the San Joaquin River. We were, we were uh, interested in uh, uh, non-native species and their importance in biological communities. And then this was kind of the, you know, the beginning of the state water project. And so we were interested in the water budget and the effects of water operations on diverting a water, upstream consumption of water and diverting water from the estuary. So in this period of fast-paced discovery, uh, San Francisco Bay was transformed from a place that was poorly studied and poorly understood to an estuary that was well studied and well uh, understood. But this was the last paper that uh, John and Dave and Fred and Sam and I published together. Uh, people in this program went off to do other things. People retired, they, they took administrative positions, they left. And so I think 1986 was kind of the end of this era of big science by the USGS. And interestingly, I think it was also the beginning of a new era. And this was the, the era that led to the creation of the regional monitoring program. And so just purely by coincidence, in that same year that we published that science paper, um, the Regional Board's Basin Plan included pollutant standards, and I think that was for the first time. I think this is the first. And there was recognition that they were not supporting data to implement those standards. And so a decision was made uh, to give Russ Flagel, and I think Russ is here, a contract to make the first trace contaminant measurements in the Bay uh, to kind of set the stage for, for measurements that would be part of the Regional Monitoring Program. I wish and would love to hear stories from Steve Ritchie about all of the negotiations, meetings, arm twisting, arm breaking that was required to reach all the agreements that created the regional monitoring program and its funding. And, and it, did be, it did happen. It began in 1993. The regional monitoring program began in 1993. And um, I was present during some of these discussions. And as the RMP was being conceived, I argued to the people who were working on this problem that we at the USGF, GSGS, have the capability of measuring fundamental components of water quality that should be part of a regional monitoring program for water quality. Things like salinity and temperature and turbidity and suspended sediments and nutrients and oxygen and chlorophyll. I know that there was not universal agreement that, uh, of this proposal that the, that that the USGS be part of the regional monitoring program. I guess Steve Ritchie played an instrumental role in, in making that decision. And so a decision was made that, um, that uh, we would be a part of the regional monitoring program for a year as a pilot project. And when I was putting this talk together, it occurred to me that nobody's ever told me that the pilot phase is over. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we've been in pilot mode for 25 years. I mean, if we have, that's fine. Everything's worked out okay. I hope we can for another 25 years. So with that kind of historical background, what I'd like to do now is address the question, what has this partnership meant? And 
uh, Steve talked about the importance of partnerships to the regional monitoring program. I think a lot of what I have to say about the USGS RMP partnership applies to the other partnerships that are part of the regional monitoring program. So what, is, what has this meant? Um, one thing that it has meant is that from the very beginning, from day one, we have been fully engaged as participants in the regional monitoring program. So whenever I was asked to give a talk at an annual meeting, I was happy to do that. I look forward to doing that. Whenever we were asked to write a, a chapter in an annual report or an issue of the Pulse of the Estuary, we were happy to do that. I just kind of went back and looked at the articles that we wrote. And the first one was in the 1995 um, annual report. And it was about toxic phytoplankton in the bay. I thought the RMP community should know, based on our work, that when we look under a microscope at the phytoplankton species that are present in the bay, there are species that are toxin producers that form harmful algal blooms in, in other estuaries. And sometimes they're present at levels that might give us reason to be concerned about this. That report got put on the bookshelf. That article gained zero traction. But now this issue of toxin producing algae in the Bay has become an emerging uh, a concern. And this is consistent with this notion of adaptability of the regional monitoring program. Now we recognize that there are potential threats from toxin producing algae in the Bay. You're going to learn more about this this afternoon. And we've learned this through our co collaboration with the new nutrient management strategy and with Cadella at UC Santa Cruz who's measured uh, water samples and muscle tissues for algal toxins. And so there's a reason for us to be paying attention to this now. Um, in the 2006 issue of the Pulse of the Estuary, we announced that there were changes in chlorophyll concentrations and seasonal patterns in the bay. And um, ever since that issue of the Pulse, including the latest one that's, that's, that's being distributed today, has been an update of this time series of summer chlorophyll in, in South Bay. So the first thing that this partnership meant was that We've been fully engaged in, in, uh, and have been enthusiastic about that level of engagement in the regional monitoring program. I think even more importantly than that, what this partnership meant to us is that it allowed us continuity in the kinds of measurements that we make. And I want to explain what I mean by that. So again, we sample uh, monthly from the lower South Bay up into the South Bay, Central Bay, San Palo Bay, Sassoon Bay to the lower Sacramento River. And on this graph here, each of these black dots shows a time and location where the USGS measured dissolved oxygen in the estuary. So as we, as we go up the graph, we're going up uh, towards the rivers. And then as we go from left to right, uh, this is sampling in time. And one thing really stands out in, this, in the pattern in the, di in the distribution of these dots is that uh, oxygen measurements began in 1971. They ended in 1979. And so from 1979 through 1992, we didn't make a single oxygen measurement anywhere in San Francisco Bay. And this reflects the fact that this is a research program. And so the goals of research programs and the funding levels for research programs um, really I only have five minutes. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, okay, I'm going I'm to really whip through this. Once we became a part of the regional monitoring program. That gave us, okay, uh, that gave us the resources that we needed um, to ensure that we would collect oxygen measurements at every one of our primary stations on every one of our cruises. And so this is the distinction, this distribution of data points is the distinction between uh, what sampling looks like in a research program compared to one that now looks like it, that, that uh, looks more like a monitoring program. And I describe our, our work as a hybrid research and monitoring program. And this, this uh, so now we have continuity of measurements to meet the obligations and objectives of a, of a monitoring program. And if you look at the distance in chlorophyll and, and suspended sediments, that's the, this partnership has had that same effect. We would not have been able to do sampling at this uh, intensity without this partnership with the Regional Monitoring Program. Okay, from the very beginning, it was important to me that our data be made accessible online. And when the internet became available to us through the World Wide Web in the early 1990s, I had this vision of creating a web page. I don't even think we use the word web page in that era 
where we displayed the results of our measurements online visually so that people can see patterns, but also make it available uh, online so that people can um, access them and use them themselves. It took a while, but by 1999, this web page came online, and it's been a success beyond my imagination. So like everything on my project, the website is run and maintained by Tara Schrega, who's sitting right here. Tara is command central on our project, and I asked her, you know, who's, who's using the data? Who's accessing the data on this web page? She said that um, we get about a half million visits a year and uh, from 88 countries. So whatever reason, uh, almost half the countries of, on the planet have somebody who's interested in water quality data in San Francisco Bay. So how are these data used? And uh, that's what I'd like to finish with. Um, first of all, the data are used in assessments, and this is one of the objectives of the Regional Monitoring Program. This is a new assessment that was led by Martha Satula from Squirp and Dave Sen. And uh, this assessment addresses the question, how much chlorophyll is too much in San Francisco Bay? Is there a tipping point in, in chlorophyll in the bay beyond which we might see harmful consequences, things like harmful algal blooms and, and hypoxia? This, this, is, this report was actually has a companion uh, research article that was just published. And it's based on, this assessment is based on statistical relationships between the probability of occurrence of a harmful algal species reaching an abundance that's a level of concern as a function of chlorophyll. And some regions of the bay have this negative relationship between dissolved oxygen during the summertime and the amount of chlorophyll that was produced during the, during the previous seasons. That's not true for all parts of the bay, but for, for some. So here's an example of an assessment that was based entirely on the data that we've collected as part of this, as part of this partnership. So, so the data are used in assessments. They're used to measure status and trends, which is another objective of the regional monitoring program. So we know, for example, when we look at nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in San Francisco Bay relative to other estuaries like Chesapeake Bay, they're higher here. So the, stat, the nutrient status of the bay is enriched, highly enriched in nitrogen and phosphorus. And trends. This is a trend that I think many of you know. For a couple of decades, summer chlorophyll in the south it was low, and up all of a sudden it shifted to a new state. And th this was a, a surprising uh, outcome to us. Uh, it took us a while to figure out that this was actually tied to a change in climate forcing of the Northeast Pacific Ocean. The, the upwelling index started earlier and lasted longer. There are biological effects in the coastal ocean that propagated into the, into the bay. And so th these changes in chlorophyll production in the bay were the motivation for creation of the nutrient management st strategy that you're going to hear about this afternoon. So here's another use of data in terms of setting scientific directions. The data are used to make decisions. And this is a letter that Tom Mumley wrote to the U.S. Geological Survey talking about the value of the information that we're collecting in terms of informing high stakes decision making related to nutrients. When somebody in the position that Tom Mully is um, at, at the regional board gives these words, speaks these words to the USGS, they carry weight. And so um, it, it's very important to USGS leaders to learn that the data that we're collecting are, are being used to inform decisions. I've been really shocked by how the data are used by the scientific community, and I think it's partly because they're readily available online. You don't need to read any words here. This is just a compilation of 50 different scientific articles that have been published that have used the, the data that we've collected. There, there are many more. And the range of to topics was beyond my imagination, from archaeology to, to zooplankton ecology. Um, in terms of modeling, I think every single hydrodynamic model that has been or is being built of San Francisco Bay uses our data, either salinity or temperature, to calibrate or validate the model. In these papers, you'll, you'll typically see a plot like this showing salinity, high salinity in the South Bay and decreasing salinity going up to the rivers. These are our measurements compared to simulation results. We will never know and can never know the skill level of models of uh, describing this estuary without knowing how well they match data. So data are essential for model uh, calibration and... Okay, data are used in the classroom. 
this is a message that I got from a professor at, uh, at San Jose State last fall, and she teaches a course on water resources management and uses the data in her course. Dave Schollhammer, my, my friend and colleague over here, taught a course in coastal hydrology at UC Davis that was based on, uh, based on these data. And I thought this was so cool that when I was editing this journal, Estuaries and Coast, I asked Dave if he would write a paper about this, and, and he did. So the data are used in the classroom. The data, I see that this is on a timer now, so I have no choice but the The data are used by graduate students. This is a message I got from a graduate student um, last fall who's using the data as part of her thesis. And I think there are more than two dozen masters or PhD theses where the graduate students use the data. Um, and many of them were, were joined our cruises and collected their own samples and used our data to develop their theses. And um, I don't know if Allison Lundgren is here. She usually comes to this meeting. She's an example. She was a student of Russ Legel's in Santa Cruz. She joined our cruises and uh, did this really elegant study showing how the chemical form of trace metals in the bay changed as phytoplankton assimilation progressed during a phytoplankton boom. So graduate students have, have benefited from this. And, um, and then we find users of the knowledge that we produce that just come out of the blue. Uh, I got this email message last fall. Dear Dr. Quinn, I'm, I'm following up with you to say thank you so much for your time and attention. I got so much good information from you and I'm very grateful. Almost done with my article. Uh, Noah. Noah is a sixth grader, uh, <laughs> and um, he, uh, he was doing a project on climate change in San Francisco Bay. And he said, I have to interview two people as part of this project. Can I interview? And I said, sure. But I said, I'd like you to read these two things that I sent him. I thought he could understand. And then I'd like you to send me a list of questions for the interview so I can prepare for it. He sent me 10 phenomenal questions. We spent an hour and a half on the phone, and then I got a message later from him telling me that he got an A on his report. So, <laughs> God bless you, Noah. Okay, so um, I probably you figured this out that the tick marks on this timeline here represent the dates in which we collected water samples and analyzed them in the, in the bay, beginning on April 10th of, of uh, 1969 to last week. Uh, the, the people who are on the boat working actively now are Charlie and Erica. And uh, this is our new research vessel. It's the David H. Peterson, named after Dave Peterson, who was hired in 1967 and started all of this. And, um, and uh, I need to tell you that this part of the, of the vessel was not on the ship when we purchased her. Uh, this is the laboratory, and the laboratory was built with funds provided by the nutrient management strategy. So thank you to Dave Sand and the coordinators for approving this expenditure. Otherwise, we'd be filtering out on the deck and the wind and the rain. And um, the last thing that I want to do is uh, take you on a sea cruise, and I hope this works um, to give you an idea of what it's like to sample on San Francisco Bay. Uh, oh, no, the... the this is that that's not the last thing before I should take you on a sea cruise I I um I want to I want to congratulate everybody who's involved in the regional monitoring program it is extremely difficult to build a, a monitoring program it's even harder to keep one going to keep this going for 25 years and have it grow during that era is a major accomplishment you should all be proud of this it's been a pleasure and a privilege for us to be a part of this. Today is a celebration. There are reasons for us to celebrate. And now I want to take you on a sea cruise. On the research vessel, David Peterson. I don't know if the sound is going to work or not. It's not.
last thing, this is uh, uh, Zephyr Sylvester who works for Dave Sin. She's part of the nutrient management strategy. And it's just another way in which you all contribute to, to this partnership. So thank you very much for your, for your time. There is time for questions. Okay. Sorry for the mix-up on your timing. Um, so, yeah, we have, we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much for this information. Always uh, appreciate hearing from you at RMP meetings. You showed one slide where there was a gap in DO sampling for quite a few years. My recollection is that most of the POTWs were doing receiving water monitoring during that period. So there should be some DO temperature pH ammonia data available if it would help to fill in some of the blanks. Dane Harden might have access to much of that since his folks were doing the sampling for us. Um, I think that would be great to, if those data are available. Yeah. I'm not aware of them. Jim, you've been threatening to retire for quite a while and now you're finally Right. Jim, you've been threatening to retire for a while, but you now finally uh, make, made the decision. But you're, are you really retiring? Are you, are you going to, uh, can you just forecast uh, some degree of attention you may still give to us? I, I don't know if you can tell or not, but I'm pretty enthusiastic about this stuff. Oh, really? And uh, <laughs> I, I can't imagine ever walking away from this. Um, but I am going to retire. <laughs> but we got, we'll, we'll ask you for advice and, and keep you happy. Yeah, I, it, would, it would be unimaginable for me to just say goodbye. I, I can't do that. <laughs> As I don't know, all of you know, you know the, with challenges in, in federal budget decisions, uh, the, the, the survey is under threat of losing funding, and, and also, we also know that when key players like Jim retire, their programs often are retired uh, um, as a consequence. But we are working hard with, with our USGS family members to try to keep things going. But fundamentally, we, we we're going to probably fall into some cha funding challenge. So fundamentally, though, what is the must-do uh, what would you say, and, and briefly, what are the must-dos that we have to continue uh, one way or the other with or without uh, the USGS partnership? I, I, I can't imagine sacrificing anything that we're doing right now. I think it's all high priority. Okay. I mean, the, the costs are the ship and the, and the people. And, you know, the number of things that you measure isn't very important. It's the resources to get people out on the bay sampling and doing the analyses in the lab. So whether we're measuring three things or 13 things, it's, it's not going to matter much. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Phil, can you do the slide thing? <laughs> okay. Um, so there will be more time for questions in the discussion period after our next speaker. Um, our third speaker is Karin North, who is the Watershed Protection Manager with the City of Palo Alto. And she's a gaucho, a serious, serious gaucho, has two degrees from UC Santa Barbara, a BS in Environmental Science and Hydrological Science, and a master's from the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. Um, her, her job with Palo Alto is to keep the city out of trouble for all environmental regulations, NPDES compliance, stormwater, recycled water, and air. It's a big job. Um, Karen says she's been active in the RMP for way too long, but doesn't have the gray hair to prove it. Um, I compensate for that and got you covered. Um, Karen became active in the RMP in 2006 as one of the founding members of our Emerging Contaminant Work Group. And she became a steering committee member in 2011. She's currently the vice chair of the steering committee. When she's not at work, she's squeezing in as much time with her family as she can, her husband from Australia, and her two boys that are 12 and 9 years old. Please welcome Karen North. Okay, so like Jim said, 
gym, I don't like to, to stay in one spot. And uh, I always joke that I'm the historian of the group, but I am the next generation. And Jim, I, I'm actually really good friends with John Conamos' daughter. So I am that next generation. I was raised um, seeing the science happen, having conversations, and then we're moving on to the next, one, the next generation. And I'm actually looking for even a younger generation to, to jump into the r &P because as you saw, we are losing quite a lot of our, um, our historical knowledge. And this is a, you know, it's, it's a somber week, but this is supposed to be for us 25 years. This is a huge accomplishment to keep a program like this running. So, and to take the science and then how do we link this to management? So that's what I'm going to try and give a very brief summary on. And obviously, we live in a beautiful area. It's highly urbanized. 40% uh, of the watershed drains from the San Francisco Bay. So our job really is to protect it. We have, I am a discharger as well, so we have many wastewater treatment plants that discharge into the San Francisco Bay. And our whole goal is to protect the, the organisms that live out there. My, I would love to make it as swimmable and fishable for next generation. That's the ultimate. So historically, this is what it used to look like around the bay. I mean, this is Palo Alto's photo, but as you know, we have these mountains along the bay, and they're not mountains. They're old dumps. So, our job now is how do we restore it? And the regional monitoring program, it is a kumbaya. It is unique in the Bay Area. Everyone does get along. Uh, most of our decisions are consensus-based, and they're based on science. So it's not like we're saying, oh, we need to handle this issue. Let's go and, and put forward. It's, it's a, we discuss it. We all come up with a decision. And then we ha how do we apply the science that we know? And how do we make it better? That's our goal. So as you can see, there's a lot of contaminants that they're looking at in the regional monitoring program. And it is one of those ones that all the dischargers are involved. It helps us because we don't necessarily want to go out and monitor the entire bay. It gives us ambient water quality information while we're doing our permitting. And as you can see, they also look at this high concern, moderate concern, low concern. And this is really how do we prioritize what we're going to focus on in the future. And this is really imperative for us because how do we link it to management? And we, how do we, which ones do we focus on first? And that's really why we have these high concern, these, these peers. As you can see, there's lots of different regulations that have already been helped by the science data pulled out of the RMP. So, so we have the 303D listing. We have all of our NPDES permits. We see all of us rely heavily on the data that the RMP provides. We have our the nutrient watershed permit that I'm not going to talk about because we have plenty of presentations. I feel like nutrients and nutrients and nutrients are all we talk about these days. But um, CECs is where obviously I joined the RMP, so that's my uh, baby. Thank you for Dr. Sutton and uh, Meg Sedlak because they're very, and now they have Diana. So we have a, a good CEC group. Um, copper, obviously, and the site specific objectives. Selenium TNDL is all based on science. So as you can see, there's a variety that we work on. And we're continuing to work on it and trying to the contaminants, the legacy pollutants that we're still trying to address. So the, really for me, I look at how do we take the science and how do we apply it. And we're actually we're getting some headway. As you can see, we're getting some product bans. We're getting some phase outs. So those are wins. But we need the science behind us to justify the legislators what we need to change and how do we need to change it. When you go to them and you don't have any data to back up, they just ignore you. So this is fantastic that we have these long data sets that we can tell them and we can show them. And look, we, we don't want to impact the product organisms. This is why we need to be doing this. And they listen, which is great. And as you can see, we have our TMDLs. They're very well thought out. When we pull the data, we're pulling great data. We have our fish consumption advisories because we do have people that fish in the bay. And we have a lot of people that recreate in the bay. And that's our job is to make sure that we're protecting it. And obviously, we do a lot of um, ambient water quality data. So this is the historical. This is not, this was an RMP specific, but this was our partnership with USGS. So fortunately, Palo Alto is very close to Melma Park. And Janet Thompson, she has been doing this study out near our outfall since the early 70s. It's one of the largest data sets that exists, and it's on muscles. And you can see, historically, we had a lot of silver in our clams. And then this was actually a pollution prevention opportunity because Phil Bobel, thankfully he's still working for Palo Alto, couldn't be here today, but he went out and realized that photoprocessors are dumping a bunch of silver into our wastewater treatment plant. 
And he figured out, oh, this is great for a pretreatment program. So all of a sudden, you see our pretreatment program, our treatment process improved, the silver and the clans went down. This is a great cause and effect relationship of showing the historical components of the day. So this is my baby. Thank you for the slides. <laughs> I, uh, I, we always have a, a slogan at BACDG, the Barrier Pollution Prevention Group, reuse, reuse, and recycle, and uh, plagiarize as much as you can because it's a community effort. Uh, so these are our Becky slides. Uh, but as you can see, we have a, the contaminants of origin concern. That's how I say we're, we're adapting. Our management at the RMP is changing and evolving. So obviously nutrients is where we've adapted and we're spending a lot of time on. We're spending a lot of time on small tributaries and loading. And we've also realized that contaminants of emerging concern, we don't have it in our permits to sample, but it is something that we're trying to stay abreast of and stay ahead of. So there's, it's now been 10 years, and thankfully we still don't have any required monitoring in our effluent. We're doing this all through the regional monitoring program. So it's a partnership with the dischargers and the regional monitoring program because we're trying to stay up to date and really kind of find that smoking gun. What's that next pollutant that we should be concerned about? Can we get ahead of it before it becomes a problem and causes a huge aquatic nightmare? So these are some management questions. They're still in flux, so they're going to change. But that's always how we have our CEC hat on. We need to make sure we're answering management questions because if there's nothing we can do about it, then you know, how are we going to get the data to make sure we're making effective change? So that's really important for us. Um, and really, we, that's always kind of how I look at a, a contaminant of emerging concern. What can we do for source reduction? How can we prevent it from the source? And that's the true pollution prevention. And that's where the dischargers Right. You'll have education outreach and also write letters to legislators and lobbyists and see if we can make some change. So this is the risk here that you can see we apply to all of the RMP, but CEC specifically, we really have looked hard and, and tried to really figure out where they fall. Most of our CECs are, are falling under this unclear tier one, which is good because it's not a high concern. We don't have any in tier four, which is fantastic. We're going to try and keep it so we don't have any in tier four at this point in time. And then we have the monitoring strategy for each one, obviously. We're trying to stay ahead of the issues, make sure that we don't get them going into Tier 4. And then this is how we would, the management strategy. So if we do get a Tier 4, then obviously we'll be a 3 or 3 d listing and probably a TNBL, and then we'll try and require, figure out how to do some source reduction. Tier 3, we do have some in Tier 3, and we are working on action plans or strategy. And then we're trying to do aggressive pollution prevention, so really trying to target it at the source and not just, oh, let's just wait and see what happens. No, no, we're going to be active and try and make sure that we can um, remove it and see if we can look for our alternatives, because that's the biggest thing. And then the thing for us with CECs is making sure that the substitutes aren't worse than the, what we just banned. That's a challenge that we're always having. And then we do have a lot of um, tier twos and the tier ones. So we're really trying to target how do we as a management strategy, how do we adapt and, and um, address these issues? So these are the ones that we currently have that are on Tier 3, the PFOS. You're going to hear a talk later from Meg about that. Uh, Fipronil, and, and you'll hear a little bit more from Dr. Moran after um, in the afternoon on that one. Nolophenols. And then we have a bunch in Tier 2, PBDs, um, pyrethroids, obviously pharmaceuticals, which you probably know it's kind of my baby. I've been doing pharmaceutical disposal since 2001. I'm still going to get it in. We're going to make it easy. It's getting better, but it's not there yet. Um, and then we have uh, quite a few that we're just still monitoring and, and keeping track of. So the key is, is that we're also trying to figure out if there's an off-ramp. So we monitor these things, and maybe there's a way that we can take it off the list as things improve over time. So the, we're talking about Tier 3, so these are some of the uh, what we do in terms of CEC action plans. So this is how we prioritize. It's really source identification. How do we find the source? What are the pollutants? How can we go? What legislative alternatives we can look at? Who can we twist an arm to see if they can get it out? Uh, phase out, industry change. There's a lot of things that we can do. Um, Robert Wilson, he's been part of the Barrier Pollution Prevention Group, and he's been helping lead that force, too, in terms of what can PCWs do to educate folks to reduce the sources. This is, uh, I took, Meg might be showing this later today too, so we won't stay on this very much, but this is a good sign, right? We realized that there's a pollutant, we figured out how to reduce it, and now the bay is recovering. 
And so this is a great indicator. Sorry, Meg. Should we show it? I'm going into much more detail because I did not participate in that study. Uh, Polygrammate diphenyl ethers is something that uh, Dr. Oros is here because he was very involved in this. He um, helped Palo Alto do one of the first studies. But this is another one that we're covered, and you're seeing this. So this might be one of those ones where we're looking at off ramps. So eventually we're going to continue to monitor it, and then hopefully it will just um, go down significantly in the bay that it's not going to cause any harm. And then, but the thing is that we were talking about is the whole polybromide diphenyl ethers were flame retardant, 30% by weight. Now they're looking at these alternative flame retardants. So as soon as PBDs got phased out, there's a fire master 550. They already found that in our um, effluent and our biosolids. So there is that concern of switching over to alternative products. And then we've been working through, through legislation as well, you guys know Dr. Arlene Bloom, on how to, this whole smoldering fire, which you might think isn't a big deal, but it really did depend on how much chemical you needed to add into the, what you're sitting on your cushions, which I bet you they have PVDs in them. Um, if you had to have an open flame or a smoldering. And so they were able to reduce it down so it's not just an open flame. I feel like this is Darwinism. If you sit there with an open flame for five seconds, your flame goes up, okay, that's one thing. So I think a smoldering cigarette is something a little bit more applicable. So they've reduced that down. Because what happened is California have the most stringent standards, which means the whole, if you design a couch for California, it's going to get sold throughout the United States. So this is a, a real win in terms of uh, fixing things. Still a long way to go. Microplastics, this is what uh, I believe Diana is spending a lot of time on, and Becky and Meg, um, and a lot of our RMP staff. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm missing some, sorry. Um, but as you can see, this is one that was that $14,000 study. Uh, they looked at effluent and they realized that it was banned in the bay and they realized, oh, it's there. And it got a lot of attention two years ago. Two years ago? Well, God, it was only two years ago. See the estuary conference? And then all of a sudden people were like, whoa, we have microplastics in the bay. I don't know how we didn't think that they existed there because if you look for anything, you're going to find it, especially in the lower South Bay where there's a big bullseye because water doesn't really flush down there. So. You know, that's why Palo Alto and San Jose is very involved, because we're usually the target. Um, so, but anyway, this is a great story because we have leveraged funding. We got, they actually managed to get a big um, foundation grant. So this is huge. So, how old are you guys? This is, as you can see, we have much higher than other regions, and that was off that little $14,000 study. And also, the data that we've used this is another win in terms of management. So we're not scrubbing our face with plastic beads anymore. I never did that anyway, but uh, now you can't buy it, which is great. So we're, we're, we're phasing stuff out. So it's a great cause and effect. That's our goal. Um, let's see. So triclosan is another one that we've been working on forever. We did, I think, started, that was actually part of the, what really started the emphasis of the CEC monitoring and the CEC group with RMP. We realized. That was, I think, one of the first fact sheets that farm people together was a fact sheet on triclosan. And then we had purchasing power. All of the governments used to say, no, we're not going to purchase triclosan-containing hand soap because it's not needed. And now you see there's actually been a phase-up. When we first started researching it, you go to a grocery store aisle and you'd be turning the back. You could not, you could barely find soap that didn't contain it. And now, thankfully, we've done a lot of education, a lot of other people too. It's not just us, but it's the science. The data is there, and now they're actually switching it out, which is fantastic. So, as you can see, the 2016 is banning it, and then we're Kelly's going to talk about this a little bit more in the afternoon. But the partnership with the department talks about substances control as well. How do we take the data we use, and how do we apply it? So, triclosan is a win. We do not. We have a wastewater treatment plant. We do not need antibacterial hand soap. I can tell you that right now. So, we did the study. We know it works. Other alternatives work. And so we're good. So pharmaceuticals. If, if you guys know me, this is literally my pet project. I love talking about pharmaceuticals because this one seems so stupid. Yes, you buy your medication. Yes, you should be able to take it back to the pharmacy and then whoever you paid the money for, they should be disposing of it. That seems like a no-brainer. Well, I can't even tell you how many times I've RMP helps facilitate getting data to show, yes, Surprisingly enough, it goes through wastewater treatment plants. Can't imagine that. People take their medication. People used to flush their medication down the drain for poison control. So we've, we've done a lot of headway there, but we still have a long way to go. So the data is still useful and beneficial. This is, 
you know, this is a tier two. We're not really sure. There's thousands of chemicals out there. And as we know, people are taking so many more medications these days. So we're going to get more and more coming into, into our waste collection plant. But we're still participating in more studies with the PHWs. Hopefully, the data will help facilitate getting more back take back. So Walgreens just announced that they're going to take back more, have more sites. So that's great. CVS is having more sites. So it's slowly changing. It's Senate produced responsibility. We have the manufacturer's pay for disposal is taking, finally taking flight. It's going to be a long way. There's a lot of barriers and red tape to get there, but we're getting there. Yay! See, it's 25 years. Woohoo! All right. So Kelly's going to talk a lot about this, too, in terms of how do we leverage our resources and who do we partner with? Because that's really key. Because as you saw, the, the staff is small and mighty, but they do let, rely on partnerships with other groups and organizations and researchers, and that's how we're the most effective. Um, and then we're also, we've managed to get some more money from the dischargers that we figured out a way of, instead of monitoring for things that really were all non-detect, let's move that money in towards the RMP. So that was a big win for us. It was fantastic. And then we're also looking at when we do uh, maybe have a, a discharge that we're going to get fined for, we can choose to have that money now go to RMP. So we're looking at other sources of money. So I'm not asking and I'm not encouraging us to get fined, but if we do, at least we can go towards uh, something beneficial for the day. And this is our key. A lot of, some of these people have actually left and retired this group, um, but we're always looking for new, new people. and. Doesn't matter what age, demographic, whatever, we take you open arms. Our meetings are all open. The more, the merrier. And if you're engaged, you're going to actually help drive the science. That's what I realized of my being there since 2006. I was like, oh, I said this one comment, and they're actually going to do something about it. Oh, this is amazing. So you can help drive the science. It really is a team effort. Um, and yes, we're, we're lucky there. And this was, I, was one, one of the pulses, and this was a, a vision that I really enjoy, especially being managing, help manage stormwater as well. How do we make it so our cities are green as possible? Where we almost blend in. So then whatever is discharging out into the bay, it's hopefully really clean water. That's our goal. So that's it. So thank you guys. Um, we'll have a, we have 20 minutes for discussion. Um, are there any um, short questions for Karen uh, based on her presentation? Ask these guys questions. They... I'll, I'll tell you what. I won't ask. Quick. I'll make a, I'll make a comment. Um, I finished my talk by saying the biggest challenge the program has is not technical. Is that transition to the next generation? I had not met Karen before, uh, <laughs> but I will tell you, I, as I'm sitting there watching that presentation, I'm going, maybe you don't have such a challenge after all, <laughs> because this is the first to clue. Yes, like let me. <laughs> let me even elaborate on that. I think the thing that makes the RMP really work, and I, and I see the same thing in my organization, is that she introduced herself originally as a discharger. But she doesn't think like my job is to discharge. She thinks like my job is to clean the water. And what she's doing is she's saying that there are certain things that are really where I want to focus my time and energy because they make the most sense to do it. The RMP helps guide where I put my effort, helps guide where I don't have to put my effort, and then also uses the RMP to do the things that are the exploratory things. We don't know whether we should be doing anything, but are too hard for an individual organization to assess themselves. So by doing a regional program, the fact that she so fully gets what you get out of the regional program tells me you guys have a very bright future. That was great. Thank you. See, I'm too, you know, I'm too young. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to start the discussion um, session by, uh, with, with a question of my own. And um, I really, uh, I love history. I love Jim's presentation. I love celebrating the 25 years. and. Um, and you know, looking looking back uh, at the formation of the program and, and all the things that have happened um, in the last quarter of a century, um, but in the RMP we pride ourselves on looking forward, and I think we've gotten better and better at this over the years. Um, so I'd like to all of us, for all of us to kind of um, 
be science fiction writers, but practical science fiction, and, and you know, with some discussion now, maybe throughout the day, um, think about 25 years from now. You know, having a meeting, hitting a big milestone like this kind of makes you think long term. If we think 25 years from now to the 50th anniversary, um, who's going to be coming to that meeting? <laughs> and then, um, you know, I'll be 80, so maybe I'll make it. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but when we when we hit that milestone and we look back, what will we think were the the big things that happened in in that in that 25 year period? What will be the big game changers um, of the next 25 years for Baywater quality? So um, I'd like the the uh, the panel to talk about that a little bit, and then um, any get any input from the audience as well. Who is that? No, you start. Come on, you're the historian. You're going, about the last 25 years, what are we going to do in the next 25 years? So this is the, what do they say, uh, we need to let the past inform the future. Um, so let me tell you a couple more stories. In 1987, we were surprised that the summer diatom bloom disappeared from Sassoon Bay. And that taught us the importance of introduced species in restructuring biological communities and made us realize that biological pollution is as much of a threat to the estuary as chemical pollution is. Um, in 1999, we were surprised to see a bloom in South Bay, a phytoplankton bloom in South Bay during the month of October. And then the next year in 2000, we saw it again in November and December. This is something that we had never seen before. We were completely surprised by this, and this led to the detective work to figure out this connection from climate to ocean to the bay. In um, 2004, we were surprised to see a widespread, massive red tide in San Francisco Bay. It coincided with a, with a heat wave with four consecutive days of record high temperature and taught us how the bay's biological system and its water quality is sensitive to extreme climatic events. And so we need to be thinking about, you know, all of the global uh, climate models tell us that today's extremes are going to be tomorrow's norms. Um, in, um, and, in, and in recent years, we were, surprised, uh, we were surprised to learn that the freshwater albopoxin microcystin is present in San Francisco Bay in water and, and clams at levels of concern. This is a real surprise because microcystin is produced by freshwater algae. So right now we don't have a clue what, what the origin is. And I think the, the high levels of microplastics in the Bay came as a surprise. So the basic message is that San Francisco Bay is full of surprises. When we think about the future, almost certainly we're going to be surprised again in the future. And I think it's one of the reasons, one of many reasons why it's so important for us to keep the pulse on the Bay. Um, so that we catch those surprises as early on as we, as we can. The other is that it just reinforces, again, the importance of this key feature of the RMP, and that is its adaptability. So, you know, we've talked about how the RMP of today is focused on different issues than, than it was in the beginning. Almost certainly we can say the same will be true in 25 years from now. I don't have a clue how it's going to be different. But surprise, we need to be prepared for surprises. Change is common surprises. And they're actually learning opportunities. So I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could give a specific vision for the future. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can tell you is that we are going to be surprised <laughs> again. So I'll, I'll add to that by maybe giving two very different types of answers. One of them is how is the RMP going to change? Uh, the other is what are the issues that we see that we need to respond to and how are we as a community going to change? From an RMP perspective, I think you all are really just getting started on something um, that 25 years from now uh, will be the whole. Right now, almost all the sampling that's being done is being done um, as a static sample, static in time or static in space. A graph sample of mud off the bottom or graph sample of water. Um, you're already starting to move towards more in the way of moorings as a way of doing it and tying those moorings even into models, particularly with mm -hmm. some of the nutrient work. Um, so in a sense, you're giving real-time predictions. So I think that's what will be in the next five years, maybe the next 10 years, is that kind of real-time um, uh, data that's available to you. But I'm going to go further and say that if you're looking out 25 years, you're going to have the same real-time information for biology. 
the things that we're doing now with genetics, uh, being able to, uh, we're actually finding it cheaper and easier to, if you want to look at how many fish are in an area rather than dragging a net, um, you can just drag a water bottle because the fish are actually shedding DNA. And we're getting to the point of being able to tell what fish were there, not even what are there right at the moment because uh, they might have just swam through. Uh, same thing with the benthic invertebrates. Instead of taking a sample and having to pull out every clam and worm and send it off to the taxonomist, you just digest the material um, and there you go. Um, you'll have an answer that day for a hundred bucks instead of uh, six months later for a thousand bucks. Um, similarly, um, uh, you know, you talk about harmful algal blooms. Uh, the people at Mavari we're working with um, are trying to miniaturize a lot of the uh, qPCR type of technologies that we've been developing for doing things like real-time beach monitoring into the nose cone of a glider. And they actually have a working prototype that can swim the bay. Uh, they have one working prototype, so we're not there yet, but uh, they actually swim the bay and sample this, um, this DNA in the water. Uh, so if you want to know, you know, uh, you talk about harmful algal blooms, you want to be able to track harmful algal blooms, you can do it in real time. So I think that will, and I think the RMP is the perfect example of how the technology transitions. So that one thing to do it in a research laboratory, it's another to actually put it in a management community. One of the things I'm impressed by in the, in the RMP is that you recognize, you don't put 98% of your dollars into the thing that is done every year. When I looked at your budgets, it looked like maybe a third of your money goes into the things repeated, and you're leaving yourself two thirds for the um, development of the future. And so there are challenges there because you have to make sure that if you're transitioning to new technologies, that you maintain that history um, so you can look at the time series. But I think that's all very doable. Um, the second 25 years is climate change. Um, I think climate change is obviously a very big issue. It's going to be the biggest stressor. Uh, that you're all going to have. Um, and I think it's a challenge for the program, uh, and, and not just the RP, but for the larger management community, because for the biggest drivers, obviously, CO2 from atmosphere from a much larger area than here. Um, so the challenges will be figuring out what is it that you all contribute here, how do things like nutrient inputs locally uh, maybe uh, exacerbate things like acidification. Um, uh, but then also figuring out what is it that you can do about it? What kind of adaptability can you put into your systems? So as a, for instance, um, obviously this is an area that SFBI has been working quite a bit, is what are your wetlands going to look like 25 years from now? Um, because they could be, you could have managing your sediment budget so they basically accrete and keep up with the rising sea level rise. It could be that they uh, move further down. Developing that plan and essentially molding your future for the next 25 years as opposed to just letting it happen to you and catch you by surprise. I think that's a good vision for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, for us, for the vision for 25 years, I think the wetlands is going to be a huge portion of it. We're rehabilitating so many of the wetlands in the Bay. Um, and we actually got uh, some money <laughs> that we're all paying into, which is fantastic. But I also think that our waste return plants and our dischargers are changing significantly how they are viewing it's a resource recovery facility rather than a waste facility. So um, I think down the lower South Bay, most of the water will in the 25 years will be uh, recycled as drinking water, um, purified and used as drinking water. So then how does that change the lower South Bay hydrodynamics? Because then there will be very little flows during the summer months. It will only be during uh, the, the wet years where we're going to need to be discharging our, our water. It's not enough. It's overloaded and also it's the Greek. So I think that's the lower South Bay phenomena that it might be. I have a feeling even a lot of the, the dischargers are looking to switch over to being a shallow discharger as well until wetlands and looking at horizontal levees in the future as well for sea level rise. So I think we're all adapting and I think the RMP is going to have to adapt and monitor with us because we need to help make sure that those things can change and move and then how do we make sure that we're protecting the bay. So, so you asked us this question. We'll ask you, how has the RMP envisioned uh, responses to climate change and how changes might unfold and what what kinds of adapt adaptations are going to be required in the RMP? Well, we, uh, you know, we, we've been thinking about things like ocean acidification, um, uh, sea level rise. Um, it's, these, uh, these are areas that the RMP hasn't really um, tackled in a big way yet. Um, we, you know, they're they're on our radar screen, but uh, 
you know, they haven't reached a point where they're on the top of our priority list and we're really focusing in on them, you know, based on, you know, kind of assessing each of these issues. Um, um, so, I, you know, I think, I, I think we need to do more to um, put more thought into um, how we might adapt to climate change. And that's part of, part of my interest in having this discussion today is, you know, trying to, you know, anticipate issues that, uh, that should be on our radar screen for, for the longer term. What about SWERP from your perspective? In terms of things we're working on with respect to climate change? Yeah. Um, so we've broken climate change into four essentially different types of stressors. Uh, one is the acidification um, and what kind of effects is that going to have on organisms. And so we're, variety, we're developing a variety of studies along those lines. And it's direct effects of the acidity, but it's also kind of going to a lot of the chemistry background of, 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 the, uh, of the RMP is how does the change in acidity, um, and I'd love to talk with Wes a little bit more, here. how does the change in acidity affect the toxicity of things like metals? Uh, because it does change the bioavailability. Uh, the second thing that we're looking at is, in fact, the sea level rise. It is basically accretion versus you know, receding uh, wetlands. Um, the, the, the third is uh, temperature, um, with the idea that you're going to have change in biological communities. And one of the things that we've done Southern California in particular, and even more so in streams, or in PSP is focused on streams, but as we start to move more towards biological assessments of conditions, those, but as the biology starts to change with, each, with, with, uh, with change in temperature, how are, how are things like the interpretations going to be? Um, but the biggest one is exactly what Karin's talking about. It's going to be flow. It's going to be uh, the seasonality of flow is going to change uh, because of things, well, obviously even more so here. As you have warmer seasons, the snow melt melts earlier and you change the seasonality. Uh, the total amount of rainfall, because you're going to have changes in rainfall amounts uh, and even distribution of rainfall. And then exactly what she was saying, it is already forcing us to think about um, uh, reuse of water. And so everybody talks about national pollution discharge elimination systems. Uh, we didn't do a lot of elimination as a result of pollution control as we move pollutants. But now that we're moving, particularly in Southern California, where we have even less water than you, um, it really is moving towards reuse at the level. We will be able to eliminate much of the discharges, which has a lot of positives, uh, but it also is going to change the stream flow because in a lot, a lot of places where we have flows right now, very much of it in the summer is the waste outfall from uh, wastewater treatment plants. And so having to balance that, that kind of need um, for the stream versus, or, and, and, and the estuary, versus the use of human drinking water. Your question is also a good segue to the next session, which will talk about our work in the margins of the bay. So one of the things that we have been doing is, you know, moving in that direction. Um, you know, Phil's going to lay out the rationale of why with, you know, with rising sea level, with climate change, uh, with reduced water inflow or management of, uh, of things like um, the brine from reverse osmosis, that you know, the, the, the mar we think the margins are going to be a, a critical area for, for future monitoring. We're trying to set the baseline for that now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to yeah, open it up to the audience now. Um, Jim, you've always, you've, you've always got uh, good, good questions at these meetings. Okay. Naomi's got the microphone. Okay, Naomi's got the microphone. Let's do Jim next. <laughs> I don't know if I should. Uh let my board member go first, but um, <laughs> I was just going to say, echoing what both Steve and Karen were talking about, that what we're looking at is 100,000 new acres of tidal marsh over the next 25 years. So our goal is to have really a much different bay than we have today. And I think we will have to, as you all talked about, adapt. And um, I know that there are a number of us, some of us are in the room, that are working on what is that water quality monitoring that we're going to need to be doing and sea level rise monitoring that we're going to be doing in our wetlands and our open managed ponds as we as we breach them for, to create tidal marshes and we need to come up with a regional approach to doing that and where the big question is do we marry those two in this regional monitoring program or do we have two programs that are sort of side by side and um, have an overlap and look at the nexus, the water quality nexus between the two. So I think we're going to be looking at that very issue of like how do we, how do we look for all the things that we need to be monitoring over the next 25 years with sea level rise into consideration and, and a big and a very big project 
to basically change the very nature of our bay. I want to comment, this is not my first rodeo. Um, I'm going to give you a perspective that started in 1992 as a discharger representing the Port of Oakland and now at the culmination as the vice chairman of the, of the regional board and what the regional monitoring program really makes. So I'm looking back, not forward, but I think it's important. I'm going to answer uh, Jim's question. It was actually Michael Carlin that twisted our arm. But what was said was very, and Michael said, you know, we can, we can send you letters that require you to do far more expensive monitoring. I'm sure pretty much everybody heard that same pitch. But from the Port of Oakland's perspective as a discharger, what I said to my bosses and what I said to the other dischargers, not just in the dredging community, is uncertainty cuts against you. It hurts you. And science helps you. And I think Karin is the representation of how that works. Um, we gave her an annual award last, last month. We, we know how good she is. But it is that perspective. As you sit as a, as a regional board member and you contemplate a regulatory action that represents a cost to dischargers, if you've been around the rodeo for a while, you know that any cost that you represent to them means that money's not going to go into parks. That money's not going to go into programs for homeless. That money's not going to go into response for um, sea level rise and resilience. So you want to get it right. And I think the consensus that you represented and the need for that to, to make sure that when we're making a decision like that, which is a scary decision because you are really affecting municipal governance at fundamental levels. And this effort helps us get it right. Thank you. Up in the back. First, I just want to congratulate you for the 25 years. It's just outstanding. And um, I do want to make the point that uh, Echo, I think, is that Naomi over there? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to hear. I, I'm more involved with uh, the work to try to establish a wetland regional monitoring program for San Francisco Estuary. And so I'm very excited to hear that you're moving more towards the margins. Uh, these are systems that have been uh, sort of analogized as the kidneys of the bay. <clears throat> they are, those microbial communities are affecting all those uh, everything that's out there in the bay, more or less, to some degree, uh, maybe not everything. But I do think that that uh, you know, Karen was right. The greening of the ur urbanized systems and the margins of the system, especially in light of climate change, sea level rise, extreme events, it's a it's a beautiful confluence to be thinking about how you integrate the regional monitoring program with the future tidal wetland restoration uh, uh, goals and the funding even that is, gonna, that is dedicated to that uh, purpose, which could be interfaced, I think, very nicely with what you're trying to accomplish. So really starting to think about the or sort of the organic uh, uh, living tissue around the bay that is really contributing to uh, what is going on out in the bay that you basically have been sampling for the last 25 years and will continue ideally for the next 25 years. So anyway, I just echo that perspective and also I think you articulated it well right here. Thanks. Well, thank you. That's a, a great setup for the next next block of talks. And I want to thank the speakers again. I want to especially thank uh, Karin and, and Steve who were troopers today. Karin had a flat tire and she drove on it for, I don't, you know, many miles. <laughs> to get here. She's got to go deal with that. Steve's not feeling great today. Uh, but still gave an excellent talk, and of course, it's always great to hear from Jim. Um, and I think it's going to be an exciting next 25 years, so I hope some of you are, are getting excited and um, are going to um, carry the baton forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>